So now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's first speaker, Marie LeMay, Director of Ipsos's Public Opinion Research Team. Marie, you have the floor. Great, thank you so much, Ellen. Um, so as mentioned, my name is Marie and I was part of the core research team here at Ipsos that helped with the design development and ultimately the execution of this research program. My role today will be to highlight some of the interesting findings that we uncovered in conducting this survey. Um, but before we jump into the data, I'd like to turn it over to Lisa Delaney at Parade Media to give you all a bit more background and context about this study. So Lisa, over to you. Thanks, Marie. I'm Lisa Delaney, and I'm the Chief Content Officer of Parade Media. And I'd also like to welcome you to, to today's webinar. I'll be making some introductory remarks and then we'll get to the survey results before wrapping up with Q&A. In addition to Marie, also presenting today is Dr. Neha Villas of Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Villas is a physician in the Department of Family Medicine at Cleveland Clinic and a fellow of the American Academy of Family Medicine. She was instrumental in developing the questionnaire for this study. Parade Media, is one of the top media companies in the US, developing and distributing premium content among digital, mobile, video, and print, print platforms. Our partners at Cleveland Clinic are marking its 100th year as a nonprofit multi specialty academic medical center that integrates clinical and hospital care with research and education. We treasure our partnership with this innovative, mission-driven mission organization that's consistently ranked as one of America's best hospitals by US News and World Report. We'd also like to thank our partners at Ipsos, the third largest market research company in the world, which provides powerful insights into the actions, opinions, and motivations of the people it studies in 90 markets globally. Parade has been celebrating America at its best for 80 years. And America is at its best when its citizens are healthy, vibrant, and thriving. That's why our Healthy Now initiative is so important to us. Healthy Now is dedicated to pro providing audiences cutting edge, solutions-oriented information and advice on the best ways to improve and optimize their overall health. In addition to our Healthy Now survey series, Parade Media and Cleveland Clinic collaborate to produce print, digital, and video content on a wide scope of health and wellness topics. The survey we'll discuss today, Practicing Prevention, is the fourth in a series of national studies produced, produced under the Healthy Now umbrella. This survey of 1,000 American adults was conducted in April 2021. The COVID-19 pandemic shifted into sharp focus the importance of proactively taking measures to preserve and protect our physical and mental health. The day-to-day -day choices we make and our habits and activities exert a powerful effect on our overall health and wellness. Through this study, we set out to discover the gaps in Americans' commitment to key areas of healthy living and understand where they struggle. Working together, Parade and Cleveland Clinic use this data to help fill in those gaps that we've identified with content that offers expert solutions and advice. And by sharing it on a national scale, we hope our research sparks new thinking and initiatives to improve Americans' well being and quality of life. Now, Marie and Dr. Villas will take you through the findings. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, so, as mentioned, you know, this survey was all about um, Americans' health um, and, you know, um, preventative measures that they're taking. Um, so there was a wide range of topics that were covered um, throughout um, the survey itself. So first, we'll take a look at some data that really focused on how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted Americans. Um, so this first slide's here. Uh, shows you some data from a question that we asked Americans. So we asked them to think of themselves today versus before the pandemic began 
around March 2020 um, and to think about themselves in terms of their physical health, their mental health and their social lives. So here we see results for how um, people see their physical health was impacted over the course of the past year and a bit. So as you can see here, for 52% of Americans, there's not too much of a change with regard to their physical health. But if we think about the flip side of that coin, that means that the other 48%, so nearly as many, have noticed a change in their physical health. Um, and when we start to look at, you know, the proportion who say it's gotten better versus the proportion who say it's gotten worse, one in four Americans, so that 25%, um, do say that their physical health is worse today compared to before the pandemic. Um, and some interesting differences started to emerge when we started to drill down a little bit deeper into the different demographic groups. So for instance, um, we're seeing it's really that younger cohort of adults, so those under the age of 35, um, who are especially likely to say that their physical health, you know, has deteriorated over the, the past year and a bit. Um, and, and similarly, we're seeing that women are significantly more likely than men um, to say that that their health, their physical health has been impacted by the pandemic. Um, furthermore, we're seeing that just over two in five say that they've developed unhealthy, unhealthy habits. So, for instance, overeating, drinking, not exercising um, during the course of the pandemic. And again, it's these younger adults that are standing up, going from that 42 percent that we saw among the general public to 59% among this group. Um, and we're seeing a similar trend uh, when it comes to parents. So those um, with at least one child aged 18 and under living at home, this group, we saw that the proportion who say that they've developed unhealthy habits during the pandemic actually grew to 60%. This data is- um, Now, here's a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Vias. This data is important because now we can start to target our primary care outreach to these vulnerable groups. Um, now changing gears a little bit and thinking about one's mental health. So same thing, we asked people to think of themselves today versus around March 2020 before the pandemic and how their mental health has changed, if at all. Um, so again, similar to with physical health, we're seeing that just over half aren't really noticing a big change. But again, this translates into nearly as many, so 47%, um, noticing a change in their mental health over the course of the past year. Um, and again, when we start to look at that proportion of people who say their mental health is better today versus the people who say it's worse today, that gap is now significantly greater with 29% of Americans saying that their mental health um, has deteriorated over the course of the past year compared to only 18% who say that they're in a better place uh, overall with their mental health. And not surprisingly, as was the case with physical health, it's these younger adults, so those aged 18 to 34 and women, who stand out as being significantly more likely to say that their mental health um, has gotten worse over the course of the past year. Um, sticking to the theme of mental health, um, you know, of concern, we saw also that, you know, one in two Americans, so 50% say that they've been feeling stressed, um, more anxious and more depressed during the pandemic, um, and even greater proportion. So 57% have had to take a break from the news and or social media to help reduce stress and or anxiety. Um, and again, not surprisingly, these figures increase to two thirds among young adults. So when we start to look at those under the age of 35, um, it's 64% instead of that 50% that say they've been feeling more stressed, more anxious, um, and it's 68% who say that they've had to take a break um, from their phones, from the news, from social media to help reduce that stress and or anxiety. Um, and furthermore, we're seeing that just over a third of Americans have actually sought or have considered seeking help from a doctor and or therapist for emotional support during the pandemic. Um, and this time, again, this number balloons to 58% when we start to look at that younger segment of adults. Um, but also this time, men were significantly more likely to have sought help um, compared to women um, and those with children living at home as well. 
Um, the pandemic has also had a profound impact on the way many Americans want to live their lives. Um, so we fe- this, the survey data indicates that, you know, more than half of Americans say that, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic has really made them reevaluate how they spend their time. Um, and for just over half, it's had a profound enough impact um, for them to agree that it's it's really changed their way of life forever. Um, and, you know, again, when we look at those younger adults, so those aged 18 to 34, 64% um, among this group say that, you know, their lives are forever changed um, as a result of, of the pandemic. And, you know, this, this younger cohort is also significantly more likely to say that, you know, they've reevaluated um, how, they're, how they're spending their time um, as a result of the pandemic. Um, again, something that was quite concerning to us is that, you know, the, the data revealed that just over one in four Americans say that they have less confidence in their own resilience in challenging times compared to before the pandemic. Um, and we're seeing that this number increases among men, among younger adults and among parents. And what was really interesting is when we started to drill down a little bit deeper into this 27% of Americans and look at how they responded to other questions in the survey, um, you know, recall a few slides back where we asked people to think of themselves today versus, you know, in March 2020, before the pandemic, this group of less resilient adults were actually significantly more likely to say that they've experienced a decline in their mental health. So whereas, you know, 29% of all Americans said that their mental health had gotten worse. Um, This is actually 42% among this group. Um, And similarly, where 25% of all Americans had noticed um, a decline in their physical health, this actually uh, grew to 32% among these less resilient adults. Um, And we're also seeing that you know, res- adults that fall into this category are also significantly more likely to be feeling more stressed and more anxious. Um, so instead of that 52% we saw among all Americans, this is actually 71% among this group. Um, and same thing, they're significantly more likely than just adults in general um, to have sought um, help for emotional support during the pandemic. Um, so 58% of these um, less less resilient adults um, are are seeing these um, are, are are saying that they've sought out help compared to the thirty four percent who who saw sought help uh, among the national population. Um, similarly, we're seeing that these less resilient adults are also more likely to feel um, you know lonely and isolated. They're more likely to have developed healthy habits during the pandemic. So we can see forty two percent of of all Americans kind of fell into this this bucket of, of having developed unhealthy habits, and this grows by twenty percentage points um, among these less resilient adults. They're also getting you know too little sleep, you know not as good quality of sleep, um, and again they're feeling more lonely um, and they're significantly more likely to often go a full day without speaking to anyone in real life or by the phone. Um, And now looking here at people's social lives, again, asking to think about themselves today versus, you know, a year and a bit ago, um, we're seeing this time that 41% um, didn't notice a change in their social lives today compared to before the pandemic which is much greater when you think that, you know, when it comes to mental and physical health, it was at about 50%. Um, So we're seeing that in this case, when it comes to people's social lives, you know, for the majority, there is definitely an impact. Um, And when you start to look at that difference between the people who say their social lives today are better um, versus those who say their social lives are worse, there, you know, that that proportion of people who say their social lives are worse off today is is three times as big as those to have as as those who have seen an improvement. Um, and whereas it was usually, you know, these younger adults that were seeing um, deteriorating mental health, you know, status and, you know, a decline in their physical health. This time it's actually the older folks. So those aged 55 and older um, who are seeing a decline in their social lives um, with women, again, uh, standing out as being significantly more likely to feel this way compared to men. So some of these results are to be expected due to the restrictions in our social lives placed upon by the pandemic. And we hope that with vaccination that some of these trends will start to improve over time. 
Um, a little bit more data on, you know, people's social lives. So on the bright side, we're seeing that, you know, for about three quarters of adults, um, you know, many admit that, you know, quarantine was difficult, but it's making them value their relationships with their family and friends um, and, and their overall just social networks, um, you know, to a greater extent. And a lot like a similar proportion also say that, you know, they've had this strong support system to help get them through the pandemic, um, you know, but despite this, the reality is that for 40% of Americans, the pandemic has had a negative impact on their relationship with their friends and family. So, you know, despite knowing that they have this support um, and they have people that they can turn to, at the end of the day, the reality is that for many, um, the pandemic, you know, hasn't had the best impact on these relationships. Um, so moving along now to the picture of health. So here we asked respondents questions about, you know, their own health and their experiences with their healthcare providers. Um, so here we asked respondents, which, if any of the following conditions are you currently suffering from? And we see right at the bottom there that 40% say that they're not suffering from any of these, which again, if we kind of flip that, this means that, you know, 60% of Americans are suffering with one, if not more of these, you know, diseases and chronic conditions with the most most prevalent being um, high blood pressure, depression, anxiety, high cholesterol. Um, and then we have just over one in 10 who are also suffering from diabetes and obesity. So this was really concerning to us. Again, if you think of, you know, the risk factors for developing complications of COVID-19, a lot of these are triggers um, for falling into those categories. Um, you know, and it's interesting because despite, you know, 60% of Americans saying that they have, you know, one, if not more of these conditions, 81% nevertheless describe their health as being excellent or good. Um, and two thirds say that they're up to date on all health screening recommended for their age and gender. Um, and not on this slide, but also, you know, 70% say that they know which vaccines are recommended for people their age. Um, and, you know, 58% said, said that they had a system for keeping track of their medical history. So this data paints a picture of, you know, a very healthy population and one that is very informed and attuned um, with their own health care. But again, looking at some other data, you know, it, it really came to light that many don't know key information about their health. So, for instance, three in five um, did not know uh, their BMI or their last blood sugar reading. Uh, just over half, so 55% did not know their last cholesterol reading. And just over two in five did not know their blood type or their last blood pressure reading. <laughs> The good news is that most of us are receiving our healthcare information from trusted sources. And we know that we have some work to do in healthcare in making sure that our patients understand what their health metrics are and how to improve them. Um, here we asked respondents uh, where they get most of their health information. So as you can see by this chart, um, it is very clear that, you know, the number one source of information for Americans is healthcare providers with 62% of the, of those who took the survey saying that, you know, they, they, they turn to their healthcare providers for this type of information. Um, at a distant second, we're seeing that people are turning to healthcare organizations, websites. So, um, you know, CDC.gov, WebMD, Cleveland Clinic. Um, and then at about one in five, we, we have you know, people turning to the news on TV, news online, news apps, and then just over one in 10 um, looking to, you know, social media. So YouTube or other social media platforms um, for most of their health information. Um, this data here uh, looks at people's feelings towards seeking medical care, you know, within the context of the pandemic. So what we're seeing is 57% Americans report feeling safer seeking regular medical care today than they did six months ago. Um, and, you know, different factors could could be attributed to this, for instance, um, you know, where we are with the vaccine rollout um, could definitely play a part in helping Americans feel safer. So this was something that, you know, was definitely promising. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing that just over a third of Americans say that they've actually delayed regular medical care. So, you know, annual annual appointments, health screenings within the past year due to safety concerns. So there's definitely um, still a bit of a disconnect when it comes to that. Um, but the data is looking promising when it comes to people starting to feel safer um, seeking regular medical care. 
Um, here we saw that, you know, most Americans have uh, a primary care provider. So 85% say that they have a current uh, primary health care provider that they seek uh, regularly for care. Um, and among those who have a primary health care provider, the responses for, you know, their experiences and their perceptions uh, towards this relationship was overwhelmingly positive. So for instance, 94% um, feel comfortable asking health care provider questions when they don't understand something. Um, and a similar proportion say that they feel listened to and supported um, when, when they do have discussions with their health care providers. So all very promising stuff on this front. Um, switching gears a little bit, so we asked also a series of questions that dove into Americans' dietary habits, um, you know, their, their level of exercise, just to see kind of where things stood on that front. Um, so here we look at a range of different activities and habits, um, and this graph shows you the proportion of people who are doing these things often sometimes. Um, so somewhat concerning is that we're seeing 68% of Americans who are sitting for more than six hours per day. Um, again, you know, with, with the... The, the more sedentary lifestyle that people are living, you know, working nine to five, sitting at computers, the increase in watching television and, and you know, being on phones and social media, not overly surprising. But, you know, what is really promising is that just as many, so another 60% are taking breaks um, every 30 minutes or so to move while sitting for long stretches. Um, and 66% are also saying that they make an effort to at least walk 30 minutes a day. Um, other promising data that, that we saw, you know, 58% are scheduling time for exercise. Just under half are exercising to the point that they're out of breath often or sometimes. Um, and, you know, at least two and five are using a device to track the number of steps that they're taking, they're doing, you know, resistance or st strength training, um, or they're switching up their exercise or fitness routines regularly to, um, to keep balance here. Uh, we also asked Americans, um, you know, with what ease or difficulty they can perform a range of different physical tasks. And what we found was, for the most part, you know, the overwhelming majority of Americans don't have any trouble, you know, doing you know, very everyday type things. Um, but what we did find is, you know, at least one in three or about one in three, sorry, um, have trouble touching their toes or going from sitting on the floor to standing. And about one in five have trouble uh, walking briskly, keeping their balance and standing on one leg, getting up from a chair or walking upstairs. Um, when it comes to people's diets, um, you know, we asked a range of, of agree, disagree type type statements to get a sense of, you know, people's attitudes and opinions and perceptions, um, you know, in this regard. And what we're seeing is, is very positive. So 81 percent um, say that, you know, they're tr consciously trying to eat more vegetables and two thirds uh, say that when they snack, they try to choose healthy foods. Um, but then we also ask people to to look at a list of different food items and rate on what frequency they eat these different items. And what the survey found was, you know, less than half of Americans say that they're eating green vegetables at least once a day. Um, and a similar proportion say that they eat fruit at least once a day. So as much as, you know, that 81% make that effort to eat you know, very healthy and they try to choose healthy snacks, the reality is that not even half are eating fruits and vegetables on a daily basis. Um, you know, and if we look to the right here, we're seeing that instead, you know, one in 10 fall into the category that they only eat green vegetables and or fruits a few times a month or less, which is very concerning. Um, and on the flip side, we're seeing that one in three, so 33% of Americans eat sweets daily, um, which when you compare that to that 46% and 44% eating fruits and vegetables daily, it doesn't fall too far behind, um, which was kind of concerning. And, you know, of interest, it, it was, you know, uh, Interesting to point out that, you know, 43% admit that, you know, despite eating this stuff often, they feel guilty when they eat sweets. Um, looking at, you know, people's habits when it comes to eating, you know, meats, um, we, the study found that 52% of Americans say that a meal isn't satisfying unless it contains meat. Um, so despite, you know, trends towards, you know, plant-based diets, plant-based foods, there's definitely a sizable proportion of Americans who are, you know, adhering to, you know, the traditional meat and potatoes type of idea when it when thinking of meals. And it's not surprising that men um, were definitely drivers behind this change where I think uh, behind this trend where I think 
63 plus uh, percent of men, you know, felt agreed with this notion. Um, and when we kind of break down what kind of meats are, are Americans eating, um, when we looked at fish, so, you know, salmon, tuna, or other fish that is not fried, um, 22% say that they eat this, you know, twice a week or more, while about 14% never eat fish. Um, and if you flip that and look now to, you know, processed or cured meat, so bacon, sausage, ham, salami, um, the proportion who eat that twice a week or more doubles compared to, to the people who eat fish on this basis. Um, so 40% saying they eat these processed meats twice a week or more, while only 8% um, never eat this. And I um, think just a few Oh, sorry, go ahead, Dr. Yes. I think as healthcare providers, we should probably drill down with our patients to see why it is that they're not incorporating more plant-based foods into their diet. Is it a simply a lack of access um, or is it a lack of education? They weren't aware what's healthy, what's not, or uh, is, it a, is it patient preference? So it remains to be seen what it is that's causing these numbers to, to be so high. Um, and just to finish off the section on, you know, diet, uh, we have a couple interesting, you know, facts and figures about snacking. Um, so, you know, the survey found that more than half uh, snack when they're stressed. And this was especially true for women and those under the age of 35. Um, 69% say that when they snack, they treat themselves to whatever they'd like with parents standing out in this case. Um, and again, thinking back to a couple of slides where 66% say that, um, you know, when they snack, they try to choose healthy foods. There's definitely like a little bit of a disconnect there. And if anything, you know, a slightly greater proportion saying that they eat whatever they want when they feel like having a snack. Um, moreover, 55% uh, report eating snacks straight from the box or bag multiple times a week, including 23% who do so daily, you know, again, making it hard to maybe portion control um, and 41% eat standing up or in front of the TV multiple times a week, including 25% who do this daily. And, you know, it's, we saw there wasn't too, too much variance across the different demographic groups when it comes to eating habits, but definitely the younger folks stood out when it come, when it came to, um, you know, eating snacks straight from the box or eating while, you know, watching TV. Um, so they were much more likely to do this. So turning now to um, American sleep habits and sleep struggles, um, what we were seeing was that, you know, sleep issues are definitely prevalent uh, for most Americans. So as you can see here, um, we're, we saw that 56% of Americans overall say that even though they sleep during the night, they feel sleepy during the day. And when you start to look at this data across the different age groups, Again, it's that younger cohort of adults, so those under the age of 35 who are especially likely to agree with this statement with three quarters saying that even though they sleep at night, they're feeling sleepy during the day. Um, more, if you look at, you know, that middle portion of the graph, another 53% um, have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. Again, with those 18 to 34 year olds standing out as being particularly likely to agree. Um, and then we have just under half, so that 46% who feel that they get too little sleep at night. Um, and here there wasn't too many, you know, significant differences across the age groups, um, but we're seeing it's that mi those middle aged adults, so those between the ages of 35 to 54 who report getting too little sleep at night, while, you know, for the older adults, those aged 55 and older, um, they kind of fell, fell lower, which is a, a good sign. Um, other stats about, um, you know, sleep habits. What was really interesting to us is that 40% of Americans say that they know how to get better sleep and they just don't do it. Um, and when you start to, again, look at these different habits in more detail, so we see that 47% are reading, working, or studying in bed before sleep. 59% um, are watching TV or streaming content before they go to bed. Um, and another 69% are sleeping with their cell phone in the room. On kind of 
a more positive note, at least we're seeing that, you know, 67% have a, a good bedtime routine um, saying that, you know, they go to bed and they wake up at about the same time every day. Um, and, you know, when we start to look again at these differences that emerge across age groups, it's consistently those under the age of 35 who are especially likely to say that, you know, they sleep with their cell phone in their room, they're watching TV before they go to bed, or they're reading, studying, or working in bed before they go to sleep. Um, and on the flip side of that, it was actually the older adults, so those who are over the age of uh, 55 and over, who are actually significantly more likely to have a more stable bedtime routine um, and say that they go to bed and wake up at the same time every day. And this should be highlighted because sleep is such an important part of health. And I think a lot of people don't recognize the importance of that. Uh, it's important to be educated about what healthy sleep is, what you should and shouldn't do, where the cell phone should be, it should be turned off, you no know, screen time. All of those are really important facets of uh, healthy sleep, which in turn leads to better health. Absolutely. Um, and finally, we asked respondents a series of questions about, you know, their habits and their social lives. Um, so this data in, in this next section really explores how people are connecting socially in these challenging times. Um, so here, what we, what we saw in the data was that, you know, for nearly two in five, um, you know, 30 percent of the population is is reporting that they feel lonely um, and this jumps to 55 percent among those 18 to 34 year olds um, furthermore we saw that 37 percent say that they often go for a full day without speaking to anyone in real life or by phone and again when we look at those younger adults they're the ones that are especially likely to stand out here with this increasing to 45 percent among this segment um, and lastly we saw that three in ten um, say that they often feel left out depressed or inadequate after using social media and you guessed it it's those younger adults that are once again standing out here with 51 percent having these feelings of isolation and you know depression after using social media we also saw that 58% um, say that they try to limit the amount of time they spend on phones and electronic devices. Um, but when we start to dig deeper into some other data, again, we're seeing a bit of a disconnect here. Um, so for instance, we're also seeing that two thirds um, say that they're spending more time emailing, messaging, or texting with others, um, as opposed to talking on the phone or meeting in real life. Um, we're also seeing that just over six in 10 are turning to social media to communicate with friends and family through likes and comments. Um, and we're also seeing that uh, two in five admit that they often use their cell phones when they are in the company of others. Um, and this time, you know, when it comes to these stats on the left, it's not only the 18 to 34 year olds who were significantly more likely to stand out, but it was actually also those middle aged adults. So those aged 35 to 54 um, who were significantly more likely to agree with all of these statements compared to those um, in, in, in the older age bracket. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Lisa to answer some questions. Yes, thank you, Marie and Dr. Villas. Um, today, Parade and Cleveland Clinic are releasing a series of content based on these results. You can find the full findings report and extended content at parade.com forward slash healthy now survey. We are in the early stages of planning a second 2021 survey and webinar in the fall. We'll share more details at a later date. I hope you find these uh, findings informative. Uh, now we have time for a few questions. We wanna dig into the data a little bit more with Dr. Bias. And um, if we don't get to your questions uh, before the end of our time, we'll follow up with you um, by email. So, so Dr. Bias, um, you know, the survey covers a lot of ground. What do you think are the three most important takeaways? 
Sure. So first and foremost, the sleep as being a fundamental part of health should be highlighted. Uh, it, it is a strong link with sleep, uh, lack of sleep, lack of good sleep, and overall health. So definitely that's something that people should be aware of. Second is, of course, mental health. Um, we Mental health, to some degree, in some groups, has taken a nosedive. And it's important to, as healthcare providers and as educators, to make sure we understand the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety. And also to teach our, our patients, our colleagues, about resilience and grit and those things that we need to um, to be strong during these moments uh, during the pandemic. And the third is, of course, diet. Um, we still have some work to do about what constitutes a healthy diet. Great, thank you. Um, we did have a question about the, 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 dis the disparity between the 81% of people who rate their health as good or excellent, yet less than half eat green vegetables once a day. So. You know, is it possible to be healthy despite this um, discrepancy? Um, and can you remind us what the number of recommended servings of vegetables is per day? Of course. As you know, health is composed of a number of different things, and uh, eating vegetables is but one component of it. So yes, it's quite possible for somebody to consider themselves healthy and may not have a preference for fruits and vegetables as much as someone else. Um, typically, the you know recommended allowance is between about four or so cups of fruits and vegetables a day. Um, so, so yes, the answer to your question is, Yes, there's a possibility. There are other aspects of health, and that's why we did this survey, because it shows what various components um, can, are considered to be uh, making up health. Great. Um, another question from the audience. Regarding the 22% of respondents who have seen improvements in their physical health compared to prior to the pandemic, what are some possible reasons for that? Have you anecdotally seen this in your practice? And what can we learn from those who are thriving? That's true. We can learn a lot from those who have taken advantage of the extra time that they may have during the pandemic uh, with less commutes and have devoted themselves to become more disciplined in perhaps weight loss or exercise. Um, they had a goal in mind and they had a plan of action and they were, uh, as I said earlier, they were resilient. They made the most of the situation uh, which uh, others may have found to be challenging. Great, is it possible that also people's, you know, they're not commuting like they had been, they have a little more found time to, to actually exercise and and you know prepare their own meals rather than driving through the drive throughs or the fact that the restaurants were closed and you know they're eating at home more so maybe that's part of it yes that wasn't a blessing for for many people during the pandemic less commute time great um on the, the subject, I have another question on the subject of uh, delaying regular uh, health care I think the I think the stat was 37 percent of people delayed uh, regular health care during the the height of the pandemic. Um, what are the consequences to, of delaying regular checkups and screenings, et cetera? Have you seen in your practice an uptick in conditions that are related to that, or like or you know negative health outcomes because people have waited? Yes, the reality is that people were scared to come into the doctor's offices or any medical buildings, and as a result, they did delay care. And many of our screenings are cancer-related. So delaying routine cancer screenings can lead to a diagnosis of cancer at a later stage than what would have been picked up had screening been implemented in a timely manner. Great. That's definitely concerning. But luckily, you know, our data also says that people are feeling more comfortable um, going back into the, the doctor's offices. So um, yes. that's hopefully improving. 
Um, Our doctor's offices and medical office buildings are safe. And uh, we are also doing outreach efforts to get our most vulnerable patients back into the office and getting their screenings done quickly. Great. Um, kind of switching gears, there was a question about uh, the social media usage. It seems like more than one third of people reported experiencing negative effects from using social media. Is it possible to use social media in a healthy way? You know, we were relying on social media a lot during the pandemic because we couldn't see people in person. And uh, so is there is there a, a healthy way to use social media so that you're not experience the, experiencing these kind of negative effects of doom scrolling and all of that? Yes, you're absolutely right. Their social media has been profoundly overutilized during the pandemic because our other forms of communication have been so limited. But there is a link between social media use and an increased risk of mood disorders, depression, and even sleep disturbances. So the reality is we do need to set limits on ourselves with regards to how much social media time we devote. Um, also, use it to truly engage with others and not simply just lurk in social media, really connect with others and, and comment on posts and, and making sure that, um, you know, you give what you received. So it works both ways. And also making sure that we limit our social media right before bedtime as well, because that can interfere with our sleep. Great. Um, let me see another question we had from the audience. Um, are you concerned about the percentages of Americans who don't know their blood pressure and blood sugar and BMI? Um, are you concerned and why? It shows that we have some work to do in terms of explaining to our patients and our colleagues about what health metrics are. And, you know, those are the body mass index, the blood sugar, the cholesterol, and also to explain it in terms that people can understand. One of the things we do in our practice is we take your cholesterol numbers and we use risk calculators and we determine your risk of experiencing a heart attack or a stroke with the numbers that you have. And that gives people people a little bit more information and it allows them to make their healthier choices with that information. So it's not just telling people the numbers, but explaining the numbers in the context of their health. Great. Um, moving on to another question in another area. Um, due to the pandemic and some of the country quarantining for over one year, Many adults started connecting with doctors via telemedicine. Have you have you seen that? And is that a, a you know a good replacement for office visits? Um, and do you see the that trend um, continuing? Yes, telemedicine has been so helpful during the pandemic. And although face-to-face -face medical care is returning back to pre-pandemic levels telemedicine is here to stay. And it is quite helpful for certain conditions, um, certainly that ones that don't need a stethoscope or, you know, or conditions such as dermatologic conditions. Um, those who have more mental health concerns can safely be evaluated in a telemedicine visit. And certainly if you're out of town or unavailable in the area in which your doctor is, those are excellent, excellent options for telemedicine. So it's here to stay. Great. I think I have one more question. We had a question from the audience. Um, you know, we had we had some um, data around isolation, people feeling more isolated. Um, they were uh, th this question is what about older people slash seniors feeling isolated in the pandemic? We've seen data on this from health plans and others like AARP, largely to due to the digital divide. So these are people who may not have access to social media or other ways to connect. Um, lack of broadband for lower income seniors and things like that. Uh, are you seeing any, did, Marie, I don't think we saw any uh, significant differences in the, the data around isolation for uh, the 55 plus um, cohort, did we? 
Oh, well, if anything, you know, when it came to people feeling lonely, um, it was those younger folks that actually stood out. So if anything, the older folks were were trending below the, the overall average. Okay. It does show to the resilience of our older patients then that they are able to tolerate these these higher levels of isolation. Certainly, I think vaccination will be very helpful in changing this around. And uh, as more and more um, rules are relaxed about isolation and uh, distancing, I think these numbers should hopefully improve for the better. Great. Thank you, Dr. Villas. And I think I think that's it for our question and answer period. Well, actually, um, I think we're just getting a couple more in. Um, do you Ooh. want to take a look? Sure. Let me take a look. OK. Oh, there's another one. I'm sorry. Let's see. Um, well, let me ask you about sleep. You did talk about, there's another, there's a question about sleep. I know you talked a little bit about sleep, um, Dr. V is during the presentation. Um, and you mentioned sleep being important for your health. Why do you think Americans don't prioritize sleep? They, you know, we had 40% of people say they know how to get better sleep. They probably know that they shouldn't be streaming content on their phones in bed and sleeping with the phone in the room, um, but they're not doing that. How, why do you think they don't prioritize sleep? And how do you encourage your patients to get better sleep? I think during the pandemic, um, we sort of took our sleep for granted. Some of us did get more sleep during the pandemic because we did have shorter commutes. But I think some of us did develop some healthier, some unhealthy habits. Um, such as a little more screen time or staying up a little bit later or, or uh, not having consistent sleep patterns or maybe even moving around less. So, you know, many of us were tethered to our home desks and as a result, we weren't getting out and walking to our cars or walking from the parking lot to our office buildings. So sleep kind of was put on the back burner. But as we know, sleep is linked to a number of medical conditions, obesity, sleep apnea, a lack of concentration and other mental health concerns. So sleep is definitely big on the healthcare priority list and should be for all Americans. Do you have, um, do you have, how do you counsel patients about getting better sleep? We talk about what their current sleep patterns are and then we see if there's room for improvement. Perhaps it means limiting their screen time right before bed, keeping their rooms a little bit on the colder side. Um, if they have a bed partner who snores or perhaps uh, accommodating for that, earplugs or having some sort of ambient noise like a sound machine or a, a fan going. So there's a number of different healthy sleep tips and also making sure to have a consistent bedtime and waking up time that doesn't differ by more than an hour on the weekdays and the weekends. Great. That is great. Uh, let me see if we have other questions. You know, back on the, uh, the diet um, question, you know, there was there were some stats on, I think someone's asking a question around the importance of plant-based diets and the sort of discrepancy that we're seeing between um, what is sort of the, you know, the emphasis that has been on plant-based diets, but the reality seems to be, you know, not that that's not really happening for Americans. Um, again, sort of how do you counsel your patients um, in this regard uh, to get them to eat? I mean, do you focus on eating less meat? Do you focus on eating more vegetables? And, and how do you, how do we help them um, get over the whatever barrier there is to uh, eating more healthfully? That's a great question. Food is about so much more than exactly what we eat. It is related to our cultural ties. It's related to uh, so many things about ourselves. So we really sit down and we drill down with our patients um, how they eat, when they eat, and what they eat. And if there are some modifications that we can make, we do so. It might be, you know, 
substituting a meat ba- a plant-based product for meat maybe just once a week, trying it out. Um, you know, doing it in the company of your friends where there's a little bit of social proof. You know, if you see other people eating a different way, then it, it also may make you want to eat a certain way. But food is just more than just a simple eat this and and don't eat this. I think it's so much about who we are. And we really need to individualize it for each of our patients. Great. And I I would think that, you know, some of the just the nuts and bolts of preparation, um, this is not something that people cook very, very often and very, maybe very well. Uh, So Matt, maybe that's something that uh, an area where we can help with more education, better content. That's kind of what, what we do is try to try to help fill those gaps. All right. I think that we are out of time uh, now and we've exhausted our questions from the audience, but I appreciate the, the enthusiasm and all of, of these great questions. And um, Dr. Viaza, Viaz, thank you so much for, for sitting in the hot seat and answering all of them. My pleasure. Thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure working on this survey. And it just, I look forward to seeing the answers as the survey continues to be um, distributed to others. Thank you. Well, I'm just going to jump in and um, give a big thanks to our speakers for all the great insight they shared today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, You will receive an email with a direct link to today's recorded presentation, and that will likely come sometime tomorrow. And of course, at any time, we welcome the opportunity to speak with you. So please feel free to reach out to us directly. That now concludes today's webinar. Have a wonderful day.